Hello, everyone. So welcome to the first of a series of online conversations and podcasts from the Connected Learning Alliance. Uh, we'll be featuring books and research that helps educators, parents, researchers, and technology makers make sense of learning in the digital age. Uh, I'm Mimi Ito. I'm your host today. <laughs> I'm also director of the Connected Learning Lab at the University of California, Irvine, and one of the cheerleaders and advocates for the Connected Learning Alliance. So I'm really delighted to be uh, kicking off this series with a longtime friend of the Digital Media and Learning Initiative and Connected Learning. Uh, Anya Kamenetz covers education for NPR, but she's also a very prolific author of books that are really relevant uh, and of interest to our community at the Connected Learning Alliance. Uh, she's written uh, books like uh, DIYU, which is about open and online learning, uh, among other things, uh, a book called Generation Debt, uh, The Test. So a lot of work on uh, education, uh, a lot of work on new um, technology and how it intersects with education. And uh, today we'll be talking about Anya's most recent book, uh, The Art of Screen Time, which is really, <laughs> there we go, uh, has a beautiful cover. I love it. Uh, and it's really for parents, but really anybody who's kind of interested in how uh, families, uh, kids, parents are navigating all of the new kinds of devices and online content that uh, we're increasingly inundated with. Uh, so what I love about uh, Anya's writing uh, is that not only is she super smart about how she writes about things, but she's also very responsible in the sense of uh, doing really careful research and uh, looking at the evidence, which of course something is something that I really appreciate as somebody who's an academic and uh, you know involved in the research, but also trying to translate it in ways that are accessible and also practical. So it's really rare that you see writing in this area specifically. Um, you know, around kids and technology that doesn't kind of fall into that trap of oversimplifying or sensationalizing things. So I think uh, that's one of the things that uh, is most impressive, not only about this book, but I think about Anya's writing in general uh, is the careful attention to sort of the broader historical and social and cultural context. So all you research nerds out there will uh, find a book that uh, is, you know, meant for general readership, but is also very uh, careful and respectful of doing that kind of intellectual work that we all care about. Um, and also elevating topics like equity and di diversity, which is a big um, thing for our community and not assuming that uh, all people are experiencing these changes in education technology in the same way. So those are some of the, uh, you know, the, the broader arcs of Anya's work that I think um, our community will really resonate with. But um, I should probably stop talking and you know <laughs> dive into some questions for Anya. Uh, we will be taking questions on Twitter with the hashtag Art of Screen Time. So uh, if you're uh, joining us live, uh, we'll try to track that hashtag and get some of those questions to Anya. So. Uh, to start off, Anya, I'd love to hear just some of the background for why you decided to write this book and what were you hoping to learn yourself and what were you hoping to share with others? Well, thanks, Mimi, for that warm introduction. I feel like <laughs> you and this whole community have been such uh, a generous wealth of ideas for me through the work that I've done that you guys are talking, that you're talking about. And um, I really am, a, you know, my parents are both academics, so I I think I write for an audience of nerds, even if I pretend to be <laughs> general interest. <laughs> but um, but so but this book in particular, it was pretty simple actually. I I went to lunch with my editor in the middle of the test, and he wanted to know what my next project was going to be. And I took out my Kindle app on my phone, and I was like, you know, I'd really like to write a book that I would like to read, that I need to read. Um, and most most of the books I'm reading as the mother of then one now two young children are parenting books. I purchase them and I read them. Um, so I wanted to write. Then I said, okay, what's a parenting book that I could write about? Well, um, I know something about tech and how it's being used with children and the promises that are being made and the peril. And I would like to know more. And I sense a huge disconnect between the discourse about kids and screens at school and the conversation about kids and screens outside of school and that's a tension i would like to explore and so that's what this book is trying to do 
investigate that tension. Yeah, that's really interesting how, you know, you looked at both because families obviously have to navigate the devices and entertainment in the home, but they're also, you know, trying to connect to the school side and very few books look at both of those. Um, you know, you, you note in your book that a lot of times there's sort of this idea that in home screens are something fairly negative that have to be managed. And in schools, there's sort of this magical potential for learning that isn't quite realized. What do you think, uh, you know, lies beyond behind that sort of cultural divide and um, what should we do about it? <laughs> well, so, right, okay. So, so the, 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 the the good thing about screens at school is that kids really love screens. And the scary thing about screens at home is that kids really love screens. And so the, the factor is the same, that kids are very drawn to screens, they produce engagement almost like magically. And since teachers are in pursuit of engagement, um, that's something I think that makes it appealing to almost all teachers in certain ways. Um, and uh, and then at home, you know, we're just more tuned into, I guess, the the scary parts of what it means for kids to be preferring something over, you know, everything else. Um, and what's interesting to me as well is that the educational benefits of media have often been used to redeem media in the eyes of the public, not only for kids, but for everyone. And so I go over a little bit in the book, you know, the the early days, only a de you know, about a decade into the television era, which is similar to where we are now with smartphones, um, in the 1960s, we had this huge, like, it's the vast wasteland, right? Like, what is up with television? Everyone has a television now, and it's just beaming a lot of crap into our homes, and it's like endless amounts, and no one can stop watching it, and, and we have to do something. And then who came out but Mr. Rogers and in the Sesame Workshop, Joan Gans Cooney, and testified and said, look, television it gives love to every child and it, it's educational and it's helping kids and it's restoring equity and so i mean the the way in which those media makers were kind of used or used themselves to sell the benefits of, of television um i think is very similar to what's happening now with educational devices and educational media um and i don't i mean it's not all hype there's research to back both both things kids can learn pro-social things from media they can learn good you know ad academic stuff for media whether it's television or interactive but um but but the two sides of that are really interesting and i think you know the other part about it is um there's interesting stuff about control in both places so media is used in school um and you know we want to make sure that they're using it for the right things and we're worried if kids are doing things they're not supposed to be doing and that's kind of true whether they're at school whether they're at home so there's this idea that adults should be deciding how kids should be spending their time. Yeah, yeah, that seems really, you know, the crux of a lot of the tensions in the home because it's an environment where, you know, it, kids exercise more agency over what they're engaging in. And that, you know, as you really explore in depth in the first half of the book is kind of the source of a lot of the parenting concerns and, so yeah, so let's let's talk about the parenting side uh, a bit because you know this is something you talk about in the book as well. But you know, parenting advice, I find it really challenging. And you know, I've toyed with the idea of writing a parenting book myself, but it's a very ideological space. Um, there's kind of this idea that you know there's uh, a right way to do things. A lot of how the advice literature is written and um, you know you talk about a lot of the parental guilt that comes with not following the expert advice and you know I think you do a great job of not picking sides in a way or kind of trying to present the range of different um, opinions uh, as well as the research. Uh, and, but I'm sort of curious, um, you know, there are obviously some approaches that you're a little bit warmer to than others, but how much did you have to hold back in terms of your own personal <laughs> ideologies of parenting uh, versus, you know, giving equal airtime? I mean, were there moments when, you know, certain approaches that you just decided not to cover or certain approaches that you're gently advocating for? 
That's a great question. Well, you asked me to put my cards on the table, right? Yeah. So, what do you really think? So first of, it? of all, I know, I know. So first of all, I have to acknowledge that by writing a parenting book, I'm participating in the parenting industrial complex. And it's this huge amount of received ideas that we're supposed to be parenting our kids in this perfect way. That is a, a kind of um, an idiosyncrasy of upper middle class Western culture. And it's a product of anxiety, about our economics, inequality, the greater risk in our society. The patriarchy is falling down. Should women be at home or should they be at work? And so all of these things kind of come to bear when a parent looks at a kid and wonders if they should not let them be on the TV or not. And it's such a signaler, right, of your values as like, and it's such a like narcissism of small differences. And I really saw that come into play. And when my survey of families were like families I asked them to rate themselves as far as how strict they thought they were on screens. And there was no coherence as far as what their rules actually were versus how strict they thought they were. Um, but everybody had a story about what other families are doing. And so you're asking me to participate in this by judging what other families are doing, <laughs> um, which is terrible. But, and, and I'm, I, but I think that, um, you know, a perspective that is not represented in the book that I wished I could have represented it is just the absolutist, right? No screens ever. Um, and that was because I, I would say that I couldn't find families like that, but I also didn't look as hard as I could have. I know that there are families out there that represent themselves as being entirely screen-free minimalist. Um, and it's not because I'm against that approach. I think it's great for you, if it works for you. I really do. But I, I also didn't think that that perspective was going to be that helpful for other people. So I, I saw a piece uh, in Slate, for example. I'm not going to call this person out. But basically, she was like, oh, I'm a totally screen-free parent. And then read like a paragraph in, and her child's 10 months old. So like, you know you're not. Like, you know, tell me when your kid graduates college that you were a screen free parent. Don't don't stay that, you know, this is what you want to do. Sure. Everybody has aspirations when their kids 10 months old. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's that. I mean, I think that um, uh, I also think there's such a thing as going overboard. I do think that there are parents that um, a lot of parents, for whatever reason, in our society do seem to have trouble exercising their authority. In, in terms of actually making rules and sticking to them. There's, that's, I don't think that, you know, you don't have to be like a conservative to see that effect and what that ha what happens when parents don't do that. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of reserve my judgment for parents who have the same amount of education and resources as I have, and then kind of say, okay, like you have the ability to do this, but you're not doing it. And maybe you say that you feel guilty, but actually you're not doing anything about it. So you know, is are you just performing guilt to get expiation for your sins, right? <laughs> and I think we do that a lot with parenting. I mean, we're all guilty of that. Yeah. 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 Um, um, it is it interesting is, it, that, that, you know, there, I think you're, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, if there's one sort of consistent message is, in fact, that there isn't a one size fits all solution in a way that, you know, there has to be some, uh, I don't know if you would agree with this as a characterization of your position, but it seems like, um, you know, just sort of consistency and, you know, some kind of shared sort of family norms are important, but that, you know, you don't want to like not being absolutist about it is actually like listening to your kids doing what's right for your family and your family's situation seems to be the um you know the underlying theme uh i guess um the the question i would have with that and you know this is something that i struggle with um a lot too when i write about stuff parent facing uh work around uh, digital media is that I totally agree with you that the underlying thing is that you have to have a set of shared values in your family that you're working on with your kids and that you come together on. Um, but there's such a hunger for sort of, you know, easy guidelines, standardized guidelines. And like, I think that's why the uh, you know, the screen time rules and, you know, even though people don't actually follow them, they get so much play. So how did you, you know, kind of handle that? Or did you struggle with that in your writing? Because I feel like 
you know, as an expert, people want some easy guidelines and they don't want to be told, well, it kind of depends. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, you know, the book might un dissatisfy some people because of that. I mean, I tried to boil things down, not in terms of guidelines, but in terms of formulas. So, um, and that's kind of in the spirit of like giving people a compass and not a map. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the, so the, you know, the, the Cliff's Notes version is the Michael Pollan slogan that my editor helped me come up with, which is enjoy screens, not too much, mostly together. Um, but the, the algorithm idea to me is like, okay, um, here are some scary things that can happen with too much screen time, you know, mm -hmm. obesity, sleep issues, behavioral issues, issues kind of around the kid's relationship to the media that they're using. Um, if you're seeing any of that, then whatever you're doing now, you should do less. That's, that's mm -hmm. move one, right? And then move number two is, um, okay, you do need a system for, you know, what the rules are going to be that are is clear and communicated to your kid. And you can do it based on time, but you can also do it based on occasion or priority. Um, you know, so like cut back if you need to cut back, make a system, and then and then think about shifting towards a positive, right? So the, the stuff that you and I talked about in the book and, and Henry Jenkins and others about, you know, what is it that our kids love about the time they're spending online? How can you build on that? How can you stretch it towards other interesting uses? Um, so that's the enjoy part. So it's not really in the right order, but that's kind of how, I think it's fairly simple in terms of, it's a formula for making decisions. It's a rubric. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a rule because there are no rules. And I can't in good conscience kind of follow, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, if they had a reason to say no screens before age two, great, but they didn't. And now they have rules of thumb because they feel the same responsibility that you mentioned to give good, simple, clear advice that people's doctors can tell them across the country, but they don't have evidence for that. So mm -hmm. how can I follow the mistake that they're making? You know, if I give, I'm writing a book, I'm trying to give people the full transparency to make their own decisions. Because if you care enough to read a book about it, like hopefully you, you do want to know mm -hmm. where those things come from. And yeah, so that's, you know, one hour a day is a good rule of thumb. Two hours a day is a good rule of thumb, you know, um, but not all the time. I mean, there's no, you, you know, there's, there's lots of exceptions all the time. There's so many exceptions. Right, right. So it's almost like a decision tree. Um, yeah, and I think this is how, like, I thought that uh, part of your book where you were talking about the um, the screen time guidelines and the fact that they weren't actually evidence-based, but more were driven by the people, people's need to have uh, simple rules. That was extremely interesting because you know, for those of us who care about the evidence side, uh, you know, we're, we face the opposite problem, which is when you really look at the evidence, it's very hard to boil it down into those kinds of rules that in fact, you know, it's um, like you said, and kids are different. There's always an exception and you can't create a general rule with tons of exceptions and expect it to really be helpful for people. So. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and I, I'm sort of a big fan of the food metaphor and Poland's work too. And um, I thought that was a very, uh, it, it was a helpful boiling down. Uh, but then again, you know, I think of my own family, my kids are older, so it becomes really hard. Uh, you know, and they're both uh, going to major in computer science, so they're probably in front of their screens you know, 12 hours a day on some days when they're like engaged in a coding project. So it's like, what does that mean? Not too much, you know? So there's always, you know, some, especially as they get older, some of like even your more flexible guidelines start becoming harder to uh, really apply. So what would you say to the exceptions or the older kids or, um, is it a particular age range that you're sort of orienting towards? Well, an interesting uh, lesson for me as a parent of, you know, a toddler and a young school age child is that um, how much less and less control you have as the kids get older and they have more and more agency. And so I do think that these and I, and I hope that I mean, the people that I'm already been out in, in doing events and like the people that are coming to the events are skewing toward the middle school and the high school because that's who's really thinking about this. But I wish the parents of younger kids would think about it more because you have so much more control, ability to set the family culture and family rules. 
Um, and I feel like when you have, I mean, if you're asking me now to project 10 years in the future, when I have it, you know, well, God, I'll have a teenager I'll have in seven years. Um, you know, I would say like the amount of, um, control that I can exert over a budding adult in my house is not too dissimilar to like my husband, where I would say like, honey, like <laughs> you need to get to bed a little earlier. I'm noticing that you're tired and it's affecting us in these ways. And can we, can we come up with a plan together for you to get to bed earlier and, or work out more or like after school, can you, you know, so basically in that spirit of here's what I'm noticing, here's the effect it's having. Can we come up with a plan? You know, this really, maybe I would even say to my husband, like this, it really isn't working for me. We've got to figure something else out. Mm -hmm. um, but not, you know, you know, you have to get very far to be like, well, as long as you're living in this house, you're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, right, right. That's the nuclear option, right? Yeah. Um, and that's how I think of it. I mean, that's how I think about it. I don't think you can control. I think you get less and less control. You get less and less, um, you get less and less uh, benefit from c trying to exert that kind of control, at least mm -hmm. in a 21st century egalitarian, you know, household, you know, it doesn't yeah. work. I mean, if you're, if you're financially supporting people, you have some leverage, but basically the idea that you need to get buy-in from people and you need to do it in a way that's in a spirit of problem solving. And, mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, a surprising number of the questions I've gotten from parents also is like, this thing my kid's doing bothers me and I would like them to stop. Can you tell me why I should make them stop? And a lot oh, of time my response has been like, well, why does it bother you? Are there things that are happening as a result of the bot? Like, and sometimes they're like, oh, because we don't talk anymore or they're not getting their homework done. So there's something that, but a lot of times it's like, well, they're not socializing in a way that I did when I, that I recognize, or they're doing some pursuit that I don't see the purpose of. Um, and then it's like, okay, so there's a conversation there, but I'm not going to give you evidence to throw at your kid to like get them to change what they're doing. Cause I don't think that's going to happen. Right. Right. Yeah. No, a lot of it, I think is about the sense that they're, they're, our kids are disconnected from the things that we want. It's really about wanting connection in the family is some sort of the underlying uh, issue. And it feels like if we can orient families towards what you wanna do as a family versus managing screens, that's kind of the pivot that can be helpful. But it's hard pragmatically because, you know, you have a 15 year old gamer kid who's, um, you know, suddenly has access to their gaming buddies 24 seven on the internet. And it's hard to compete with that sometimes. So, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't know what we're comparing it to. Like yeah. time use, time use studies, right. Show that parents spend more time with their kids now than they did in the 1960s. Yeah. And yeah. We had this image of like the ideal family, but that 16 year old, he might've been out on his own in mm -hmm. another generation, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least working and going to school and not expecting to see his parents and have like nice family time with them every single day. So that's, I feel like we're fed the, ironically the media feeds us these images of perfect family harmony or something, you know, and I don't know where we get it, but there's a, some idea that we need to be doing something differently perfectly. And um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Like, and even I, you know, I, I mentioned this a book, like one, even one of the, research pediatricians who makes national policy on how parents should be with kids told me parents are spending less time with their kids. And I said, that's not true. Right. Not right. Time with their kids. Yeah. No, I thought that was a great section of your book where you just lay out the evidence that, you know, middle-class families are, you know, spending more time and talking more and connecting more than ever before. It, it reminded me of sort of the fear of, you know, risk and danger. Um, it's, there's sort of an elevated sense of fear when in reality, our, our teenagers overall are in, you know, a much safer environment than earlier generations. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say that the sense of mutual loneliness isn't a, that Sherry Turkle talks about. That's not a real thing. I think it is a real thing. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not something to be discounted. It's just that, again, I think things change and they change for the good and for the bad. And there's, you know, it's, it's always helpful to kind of try to keep it in perspective. But of course, I mean, I felt lonely and ignored by 
my family members in the house with them while they're paying attention to other things. I think a lot of people have felt that. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I think that the the issue of, you know, that shift as they, you know, that the concerns seem to arise when parents are starting to lose control of, you know, some of the agendas, like a really interesting developmental arc as, you know, you see the different concerns as uh, kids grow older. And then for the little ones, I think the introduction of tablets and, uh, you know, iPhones and so on have kind of accelerated a different kind of um, concerns that actually I didn't have when my kids were little, which is really interesting. Um, so I, I think your point about, you know, you wish that the younger, the parents of younger kids would get to some of these habits early, I think is a really interesting one. Uh, because um, my sense too, is that some of the topics you bring up about attention management and mindfulness and just healthy healthful habits are something that you know we kind of my generation you know my like just almost young adults we kind of backed into it we were sort of blindsided by it because you know our kids were the first generation that you know could watch unlimited anime on youtube for example like there you know certain things were happening for the first time uh, but yeah, now it feels like it's just so clear that not just kids, but everybody has to learn mindfulness and attention management so much earlier. And, you know, my daughter at some point, she started using when she was a teenager apps to monitor her screen use and then, you know, using apps for meditation and things like that. And, you know, she kind of started self, you know, training herself and learning that self-regulation as a teenager, but yeah, why not start early? Um, do you, are you hopeful or pessimistic about that aspect of it? It just seems like that's one of the really big changes. I agree with you. I think that there's um, a swift immune reaction that's happening to the introduction. I think that we were the population was, I know, like I'm using a viral metaphor, right? But the population mm -hmm. was naive to the introduction of these devices and it affected everybody in these really strong ways. And now we're reacting quickly, I think. And, and there's a number of different channels of that reaction. One is mindfulness. So like self-knowledge, attention. There's so much interest in productivity. You can literally waste thousands of hours reading productivity hacks online, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right? And now there's starting to be apps built to, to help manage attention and, and wondering about, well, what are the business models going to be if it's not an attention-based economy? Can we have a web that's not based on constantly, you know, making everyone feel like they're ADD? Um, and then uh, and then the social emotional stuff, right? The awareness of schools needing to teach interpersonal um, communication and be responsible for the tone of your communication and um, you know, and how things make people feel. People are needing to be, and you might say, well, that's, it's a little cynical because it's like you're becoming remedial, you have to be remedially instructed in things that maybe older generations just learn from face-to-face -face communication. But I actually think there is progress. I think that there's, you know, we're at a moment, a very fraught moment, but, you know, in terms of who is, whose humanity is acknowledged in interaction, at the at the highest level like it's we're in a very high point for that like more people and more kinds of bodies have a chance to have a humanity is acknowledged humanity acknowledged in this civilization right now even as there is a huge reaction against that and mm -hmm. so i feel like good more humanity is good and more mm -hmm. recognition and more kinds of humanity is good and if we need these technological boogeyman or avatars to come in to scare us about, to make us think more deeply about what it means to be human, what it means to be interacting as a human. If we need artificial intelligences to get us to better use our intelligence, um, then that's all benefit. Right, know? right. Yeah, why not use tools to, yeah. Well, and why not yeah. use what the tools show us? If we don't like what they show us, mm -hmm. then, then maybe we should get better. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, no, it kind of, you know, I was thinking you 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 use this sort of healthy diet metaphor as well, but 
it's sort of like as a species, when we started to encounter a context where there was calorie abundance and we were becoming more sedentary, like this huge industry around fitness and diet and, you know, grew up like it's it's hard to imagine like a world where we're not constantly thinking about what we eat, you know, um, you, and that is sort of where we are now with information and communication abundance is there's new kinds of industries and practices and educational uh, programs that are going to have to help us. And there's some of us who, like I'm incredibly susceptible to, you know, gaming as a, you know, I have a hard time setting limits on my gaming time. So I've had to develop a bunch of strategies for, you know, what games I can play and can't play and when I can't play them. Mostly it means I just don't start playing games because I know it'll be a problem. Uh, but yeah, we all have to, like, it's a whole new sort of adaptive learning thing, a set of cultural adaptations that we're, I feel like we're pretty early in yeah. understanding how to handle that, especially for the little ones. I think we're very early. Um, and I think that I actually think that getting really curious about what kids are doing with devices is a great way forward. Because as we watch the kinds of things that are happening and that the kid, the way the kids take to the devices and their relationships to them and what it means, what it does to them, it's a way for us to learn the things that we're alarmed about happening with children. Um, you know, we should pay attention to for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the things that we're excited about happening with children, the empowerment and the discovery mm -hmm. and, the, and the sense of possibility that they just take as a birthright. You know, I talked to probably one of the most optimistic people I talked to is Ken Perlin. Um, he has a VR lab at NYU. And he said, you know, the Hitchcock and the Spielberg of VR are being born like next. <laughs> <laughs> the people that grow up native to that medium are going to be the great artists of that medium. And it's so exciting. Um, yeah. So I really yeah. like that perspective. and. You know, and let's not forget too, like like to get into the food metaphor just one more time, like ten thousand years ago, we spent all our time thinking about food because we didn't have enough. right. Now we spend yeah. all our time thinking about food because there's too much. Yes, that's right. right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think the sort of level setting of just saying, look, information, communication, abundance is good. Like it's just a good thing. It's a benefit. The reason why we overconsume is because it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, there's all of these sort of repercussions to that abundance that we have to manage. So we have a question from Twitter. This is switching gears a little bit, but I did want to get to it. Um, so, how do you address the issue of the issue of schools completely banning student devices. Do schools have a responsibility to guide students in learning how to manage their screen use for content creation, self-control, safety, real-world relationships? Just use school devices. This is from Sherry on Twitter. Um, and that's a great question. So we went through this battle, if you recall, with workplaces. Used to be that work that workplace computers were all like enterprise software, and then it was like office issued Blackberries, and then it was like, oh my God, people are bringing their iPhones to work. What are we going to do? What about security? What about you know compatibility? And how are we going to update everything? And then that's not a thing anymore, to my to my knowledge. Maybe in like very very specific industries, it might still be a thing. Um, and you know, obviously, there's specialized equipment, and some like NPR has a lot of equipment, and even software that's specialized. But it it just totally flipped around, right? Um, and the issue of control, you know, so um, schools are struggling with this. I know teachers are struggling, both anecdotally and in surveys. They are struggling with students' attention and mm -hmm. all these same issues of control and distraction and even obsession, and then the negative social consequences sometimes of the way the kids can essentially communicate with each other all the time. Um, do schools have a responsibility to guide students? Yeah, of course. This is a, a basic f skill for functioning in the 21st century. And it is, you know, got to add it to the log pile of things that schools are supposed to be teaching, which is a lot. Um, and, uh, but I also respect, you know, I respect the idea of schools making safe havens within them occasionally for screen free time. I think it's just like you can, you know, churches, restaurants, in line at the coffee shop, in a city, in a park, like there's lots of times to suggest, mandate, require, ask as a part of the social contract of being there that you not be connected. 
um, and schools to the extent that they do that, um, they, you know, you have, they have a responsibility to fill that time in a way that's worthwhile. It's worth being offline. Um, a lot of times a kid, a kid's distraction is like a, is a response to a not engaging class setting. Um, but sometimes they like being off, you know, it's good for them to be off. So yeah, I think that there, so I think it goes both ways. Yeah, it does seem good. like there's a lot of variation in how schools handle the, per, you know, personal devices or personal social media accounts within the school context. And uh, yeah, our school just moved to like, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have school issued devices, but they sort of expect now that every kid has their own device. And, you know, so, you know, we obviously are, my kids are in a very privileged context where that can be an assumption of schooling, but, you know, from a connected learning perspective, you know, they're, the thing that's um, kind of distressing about that boundary setting, like I understand why schools do it, but you know, what's the, it's sort of what you were talking about, about that divide between the in-school and out-of-school kinds of perspectives on screens. There's so much potential to connect, you know, the kind of informal and interest-driven learning that kids are doing out of school to the in-school stuff. And the rubber really hits the road when you're talking about whether they can, you know, express what they're doing in both direction, like, you know, their, their, what they're doing in their affinity networks or YouTube or whatever, if that has a connection to schooling, you know, it was interesting with Minecraft, you know, this is something we've talked about, like really nitty gritty things like when they have a mind, when they're doing Minecraft in school, if they're using the EDU version, that's not the identity that they would use for Minecraft for fun. And, you know, that makes it much harder for the stuff that they're doing for fun to connect pragmatically with what they're doing in school. So these are, you know, they're pretty thorny issues. And, you know, I would hope that educators would think creatively about how they could actually embrace some of the social and informal aspects of kids' digital media use in school. But I also recognize a lot of the challenges of that as well. I mean, I guess to borrow like a science metaphor, I would argue maybe for a semi-permeable membrane um, between home and school, because mm -hmm. I feel like um, it's it's good for kids to be able to have different personas in different places. Mm -hmm. It's we all kind of um, we want to show up and bring ourselves to the workplace or to school, but you don't have you don't want to bring everything right. Mm -hmm. There's professional totally. boundaries and there's reasons that we might want to not have every hobby or every interest that we have be something that's made part of the work context or part of the school context. So um, yeah, I, I, I think I think there's there's arguments for having like a, a Minecraft EDU address and a home address, but it would be great if you could also talk about your home gaming with your teacher and have them be interested in that. Yeah, yeah. And it's been interesting, like there's parallel issues on, you know, whether, teachers are allowed to friend their students on Facebook yeah. and you know you don't want to colonize kids fun with all the school stuff but then you know there's also it, I would think we're just entering an era where those boundaries are going to be a lot harder to police because the communication is so porous now but um, I think we're starting to get close to the end of our times but I, before we wrapped up I was I did kind of want to end on a you know sort of if you're um, open to it, you know, on a personal note about, you know, your um, a big section of your book is about um, mommy bloggers and sort of online communities around uh, parenting and, you know, the decisions that uh, parents make about what they share and who they connect with. And I'm curious, just, you know, as a parent yourself with little kids and uh, you know, it sounds like you were pretty active in online communities. Um, I'm curious to hear, you know, how did you, uh, you know, make your own decisions about what you share online and how you connect with others and what you share about your own children online? Yeah, this is a great question and it's evolving. So, um, you know, during the period of investigating and writing this book, my daughter, my older daughter grew into the age where I feel like I have to ask her before I post pictures of her and she can, mm -hmm. you know, is yes or no on those. Um, and I, I, now that we're talking about it, I'm probably getting to the age where I should even make her like help her see the pictures that have already been posted of her online and have retroactive 
right to be forgotten on them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, up until this moment, I sort of had, I hadn't thought too hard about it. I felt like I had a certain amount of public persona and um, it wasn't going to be a make or break. Like I didn't know how, um, I didn't know, I didn't know if I was going to be able to actually totally shield my identity. So I figured I would share things that felt good in different contexts. Um, but what's been help most helpful for me are communities of parents who I know personally uh, and have a chance to connect with sometimes in person. And email is a really good medium for that for me, email groups. Um, and there's a really wonderful one in my neighborhood, for example, um, that has almost 6,000 families on it. So it's not personal, as personal, but it is um, a real neighborhood network. And you see people and you meet and you recognize people's names because everybody signs their name with their kid's name. Um, and I found that those kinds of communities can be really rich, um, especially when people are contributing things, not just, you know, chatting, but actually helping each other out, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting how sort of these norms about sharenting are also evolving a lot. And yeah, I think at some point when my kids were growing up, Dana Boyd, who, you know, is a friend of <laughs> this set of conversations and in your book as well, she sort of took me aside and said, you really have to stop sharing pictures of your kids on the internet. And, no way. You know, and then she went into my daughter's Facebook settings and, you know, just how, like, you know, cause she had just been kind of hearing the kids side, you know, she, and then I, I agreed with her. Like, I, I think it's, there's sort of a point at where, which, you know, the parent needs to sort of um, stop uh, defining their kid's identity online. And, you know, we, there were definitely things that we sort of backed into like we had set up a web page with their baby pictures and things like that, which we didn't think much of, you know, this was now almost 20 years ago. Right. And, but it's the first Google hit on their name. Oh, right. So their yeah. baby pictures. So these are just things that you don't really know the implications because the technology is changing a lot too. So, you know, the fact that now they're going to have to author an identity that is about their names and what appears. And, you know, it's just kind of cute and hilarious that it's just baby pictures that their teenage friends find of them online. But, you know, there could, could it could have been worse. And, you know, as somebody who writes about parenting and kids, uh, you know, I don't think there's any way that they cannot be implicated in our public lives, but I do ask them permission now whenever I write or I, I get sign off on certain anecdotes and things like that, that I share in my talks and presentations. So I mean, both my, yeah, both my parents are writers and they both uh -huh. written about me as a yeah. child. Okay. And so you and their books, they're not, you know, they're like in the public record. Um, yeah. yeah. But, they all, but they all feature like a very young Anya. So it's not yeah. like stuff I did when I was a teenager or anything. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think that, so I do have a, a little bit of a family history in that and it's hard to project into the future and, and know these things. I think the basic question is right you know, when you're a new parent, you feel like it's all about you and your experience. That's a parent, you know, new parents are posting baby pictures. It's like, this is my life experience. This is a huge life change that I'm going through. But at some point your kid's life is about them and not about you. Right, right. And figuring out when that transition happens, um, I think is a really, really interesting one. And is something that, you know, we all have to figure out, you know, and we, you see the same issues come up too with relationships. People perform their relationships. Absolutely. Online. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, my husband, blah, blah, blah. He did this thing. And either they're complaining or they're bragging. And it's like, you're, you know, I doubt your husband's seeing this. And if he, you know, I hope he approved this post. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We certainly aren't, none of us own our identities completely on the internet. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so this has been a lot of fun, Anya. Thanks so much for taking the time wow. to hang out and chat and uh, hope you're enjoying the book tour and connecting with a lot of families around this stuff. Any last words for us? No, I just want to say thanks again to this community. It's always been a source of inspiration for me. Thanks a lot, Anya. Bye guys.
Bye.